bring him out of uh, his situation that he's in right now. And I believe God, I believe God can do that. Amen? Amen. So as we stand up and we're getting ready to worship, I want to say is a familiar face, some of us who have been here a while, Nick Bradley is right here. And uh, we haven't seen Nick for a while uh, since he played with Upper Room Project. It's been a few years uh, since Nick was here. Update, he's married and uh, still in school, going to be a doctor and doing all those wonderful things like that. But he was in Chile and uh, is here to play with us this morning and to worship. So uh, we're glad that Nick is here. Let's stand. Let's stand and uh, together let's go to the throne of Jesus and worship. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just welcome you here this morning, Father. We're just here to exalt your name, God. You are so, so, so good. We're just here to worship you, Father. Pour out your spirit. Pour out your blessing upon us, Father. You're so, so good. Through the eyes of man, it seems there's so much we have lost. As we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked, and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off asleep. But we know that you are God, yours is the victory. And we know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with this faith you've given us, we'll step into the valley unafraid. We call out to joy bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes and let us see. Oh, God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love, rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons, and by your Spirit breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save. Oh, you alone can save. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, oh, come alive. Oh, about of the ashes and let us see an army rise. Oh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. So breathe, oh breath of God, now breathe, oh breath of God, breathe, oh breath of God, now breathe. So breathe, oh breath of God, now breathe, oh breath of God, breathe. Oh, breath of God, now breathe. I'll sing that with this. No breathe. So breathe, oh, breath of God, now breathe. Oh, breath of God, breathe. Oh, breath of God, now breathe. One more time. So breathe. Oh, so breathe, oh, breath of God. Oh, now breathe, oh, breath of God. dry bones come alive oh come alive we 
call out to dead hearts, come alive, oh, come alive. Oh, up out of the ashes and let us see an army rise. Oh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. Ooh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. and shake and crumble at your name Father at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your Angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. That's your name, Father. And your name, the morning breaks in Yeah. 
this morning. You're so good, Father. Generations 
in your family, in their children, in their children, in their children. Oh, may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, in their children, in their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. you to hold on to that for just a moment. This, uh, this song is, is taken from our Bible, from the book of Numbers, chapter 6. It's the blessing of Aaron onto the people of Israel. And as Noah and Kim were singing that, and I my mind just went back to what that first day would have felt like when this blessing was pronounced. Because Israel, what you put your mind here, Israel has come out of Egypt. Bondage is all they've known. Pain and suffering and wound and in a land where God was marginalized and talked away. They've crossed the Red Sea. All they know in front of them is that Moses has said, God has prepared something for you. That it's greater than anything you can imagine. But you have to stay faithful to him. And around about the time of number six, the children of Israel were getting nervous. 
because they're about to face some real enemies, some real trouble, some real trials, some fights, some wars. They've got children and grandchildren. They've got elderly and feeble among them. And they would have went to Moses and Aaron and said, what do we do? Are we strong enough to do this? Maybe we should just turn around and go back to Egypt. Maybe we should just forget this whole thing. But God told Aaron and his sons, come into my house. Position yourselves in there for seven days. Hear my heart. And on the morning of the eighth day, I want you to go out to the door of the tabernacle and I want you to raise both hands into the air. And I want you to look at the children of Israel who are nervous and scared. And I want you to say, the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then you read the numbers blessing. Wherever you go, he will be with you in the city or in the field coming and going in and out in the valley or on the mountain through the flood or through the fire do not fear Israel for the Lord is your God not only to you but to your children and your children's children even to a thousand generations will the Lord keep you I want you to let your mind go there this morning because I have a tendency to believe Maybe there's some people here with the same issue. A little bit of fear and nervousness and God, this is a strange place and a strange time and I don't know, am I strong enough to go forward? And I'm going to ask them to sing that blessing one more time. And God, But I need you to do something with me. The people that day would have heard Aaron, but then they would have taken it as their own blessing. Because he told them, when you get home, I want you to put this blessing on your children. Wherever you go, I want you to say this blessing. Whatever you touch, I want you to say this blessing. So they blessed their homes. They blessed their families. So that when trouble came, their kids could look up to the faces of their mommies and daddies and say, hey, we're not going to fear. Why? Because God is with us. You blessed us with the presence of God. So in this moment, in this moment, when you're worried, I want you to reach out in the spirit and grab a hold of your kids. I don't care where they are and what they're doing. I want you to grab a hold of them and bring them right back in front of the Lord and say, wait a second, before you go any further, the Lord bless you and keep you and may the Lord make his face shine upon you. I want us to do that. You ready? Let's do it together. Come on. I want you to gather your family in the spirit. Let's pray. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in the children in the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in the children in the children oh, may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in the children in the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you he is 
for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Yes, Lord, we receive that blessing. We receive that blessing on our homes and in our families. (laughs) My life is covered in the presence of God. And I receive that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 As the kids are being dismissed to their classes, I just want you to look at the person next to you and just remind them you're blessed. You're so blessed. Would you do that for me? You're so blessed. Yes, amen. Well, thank you, worship team, for leading us into the presence of God so beautifully. Thank you, kids workers. Thank you for all you're doing. Amen. On our babies, beautiful babies. Amen. To all of our uh, guests who are with us, both in person and online, we thank you for being here. You're blessed. We're blessed because you're here. We started a series last week called um, Finding Your Stride or hitting your stride, and I wanted to begin this series about about walking um, to get to some of these stories that the Lord was just uh, pouring into my heart about, I guess, the beautiful and yet unexpected moments that come in walking with Jesus. There's nothing like this walk. You can't pre-plan it, and I love that about it. You can't program it. It's the Holy Spirit's leading. Jesus explained that to Nicodemus when he said the Holy Spirit's like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from, you don't know where it's going, but you feel the effect of it. This walk is like that. There's a day you get up, you think you're going one direction, you're not, you end up going another. That's God's leading. That's what we want. It's the walk that we want to walk in. And last week we talked about uh, walking out our faith, and we talked about the woman who had a spine issue. Today I want to talk about another walk that I was taken back to, and I got to tell you, I was I was prepared all week for a different message until about ten thirty last night. I walked in and told Annie, I said, "The Lord just changed my message. He reserves the right to do that." So we went on a different walk today, and I want to talk about uh, walking down the bread aisle, walking down the bread aisle. If you would, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 32 through 39. Matthew 15, 32 through 39.
Now, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude. They go major. He's been teaching on that on Wednesday night. Have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and they have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. His disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks. He broke them, gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the multitude. So they all ate and were what? Filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were about 4,000 men, besides the women and children. That's a lot of people. They're all married and got one bambino. You're up to 12,000 people. And he sent away the multitude, and he got into a boat. And he came to the region of Magdala. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for the presence we feel this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit I feel in this place. I know you want to do something great in people's lives, and God, help me get out of the way for that. I intend to preach your word with everything in me. I intend to share what you shared with me in the late hours of last night. You knew who would be here today. And you knew who needed to walk down the bread aisle. So help me preach it the way you gave it. And may hearts receive today, both here and online, to draw closer to you and be conformed into your dear image, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a walk down the bread aisle. I didn't think much of it, and and in fact, I didn't think it would turn into a message. Earlier in the week, on Monday, I'd made a stop into the grocery store. Made a stop into the Walmart. (laughs) That's a sermon all in itself. And... um, I needed to pick up a couple things, but I have been trying to take Mondays off. It doesn't always work out, but I try to. And we just needed a couple things, so I ran in to just pick up a couple things, and I was in the bread aisle. And there was a woman that was um, coming up the bread aisle, was going down the bread aisle, and she was on one of those motorized scooters. And so uh, I needed to get my bread quick and get out of the way. So they wouldn't be run over. And I was reaching in to get my bread and was going to step back and just head on. Now, I always smiled at everybody uh, through my mask. And when I smile, my eyes crinkle up and people can tell I'm smiling. But I always, you know, do the country hello, which is just a head nod. Right? Uh, and if I feel really froggy, I'll say, how you doing? Or hello. And as this lady was coming, uh, she was probably in her early to mid-80s and uh, I nodded my head, and she nodded her head, and I said, how you doing? And she said, I'm in need of some help. And I said, well, I'm just a helper. What do you need? And she said, I need bread from that shelf. And she said, I just can't do it. I want the honey wheat bread. And she said, but I don't fool with the front. I want the back. I said, Okay. She said, they put the front up there, it's stale, I wouldn't feed it to a bird. She said, I want the fresh in the back. She said, so I need you with them long arms to reach all the way in the back and grab me 
a honey wheat loaf. I said, well, I can do that. And so I'm reaching way in the back, and she says, now fill them. And so I'm filling, and I said, yep, this, this one's good and fresh. And as I'm pulling it out, she says, you know, I miss my husband. He died in January of 2020. And one of the things that aggravated him the most was my pickiness of bread. She said, he's not here to do that, and I want you to know that you have filled a task that my husband did for me. And I'm thank so thankful. I said, I hate to hear that. I shared the story of how my stepdad had passed away, and recently some people in our church have said goodbye to their spouse. And I said, you know, it's, it's only the Lord that helps us and keeps us where we need to be. And she said, that's so true, honey. She said, I just... I need him. And I said, well, can I pray with you? And right there in the bread aisle, I prayed with this sweet lady, Ruby, and asked God to help her and to be with her and thanked God for the chance meeting in the bread aisle. It was last night that I was preparing to preach a different message, and maybe one day I'll get to that one about the man lowered through the roof. And the Holy Spirit just kept reminding me of Ruby in the bread aisle. I said, yeah, I know, God, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. And he said, no, I want you to preach about walking down the bread aisle. God hangs out in the bread aisles of life. In fact, he loves the bread aisle. If you spend any time at all in a grocery store, and most of you, I think, probably have, you begin to pick up the pattern of how they're arranged. It's not by accident. It's, it's what they do. Produce is toward the front because the store, it's a long story, but long ago when they used to drop off fresh vegetables, they wanted them up front because the color would draw people in, and also they needed the freshness by the door or window being open, and they were quick to go bad, so they wanted to sell that first. Right after that is usually a bread aisle, and all the way in the back of the store is always the what? The milk. And the reason for that is because bread and milk are the two top staples on 95% of the Americans' grocery list. And they know that if you get your produce and your bread, you have to walk through the entire store to get to the milk. And chances are your impulse buying will kick in and you'll end up buying more. And this is true, right? You ever went to the store for two things, walk out with five bags? Yeah, yeah, they know what they're doing. Bread and milk. Two top staples. And anytime we're about to get a snowstorm, what goes first? The bread and milk. Even if it's an inch of snow, people say, I gotta get the bread and milk. I've tried to research, see where that came from, and the closest I can get is it came from two episodes, one 1950 in Pittsburgh, they had such a snowstorm, people couldn't get out, and the National Guard had to distribute bread and milk. And then in the 1970s, the blizzard of 78, when people were snowed in, the two staples that went bad. First were the bread and milk, and they needed more of it because of babies, and they needed staples for sandwiches. And so from that day on the American Red Cross Safety and Preparedness website, and you can go there and look, two of the top ten items to have in the case of emergency are bread and milk. And so I think it's been ingrained into our life, and, and we all do it. You know, even if you don't need it, you go to the store and you see people pulling bread off like it's going out of style, you get a loaf too. Think, dear God, maybe they quit making bread. I better get that. But that's the way it's arranged and for that purpose. And a little caveat I found out is they usually put some sweets next to the bread. Because they hope you'll buy that and put it in your buggy before you, while you're still hungry at the beginning of your trip through the grocery store. If they put sweets in the back, they don't sell as much. Because by the time you're done, you're done with the grocery store. You don't care. I'm just going to get this milk and get out of here. So they put them up front and, and little Debbie rides home with me quite often. The bread aisle is where you're likely to run into people you know because we all have a need for bread. There are people that get paid way more than you and I that ran numbers on this. If you go to the store, the average shopping takes about 40 minutes in a grocery store. If you go twice a week, you've spent 80 minutes in a grocery store. If you're not a hermit, and most people do that, there's a likelihood, of course, that you're going to, uh, and you have to factor in the size of your town and all that. So I plugged in all of our numbers for Chillicothe. There is, if you know at least 50 people in this town, there's a 95% chance you're going to see at least one person you know at the grocery store. And Annie would say amen to that. She won't go with me. 
as all the people we run into. I also add a little bit of my own science to that, that if you're looking your worst, sweats, you ladies don't have no makeup on, hair's all a mess, you look like you just got out of the hospital, you will meet double what you would if you had a shower. Psychologists have made assumptions about personality based on the bread you buy. If you buy croissants, they say you're more sensitive than others, and it generally attracts people. You have a lot of friends if you're a croissant eater. I like croissants. If you buy a lot of bagels, it means you like order and simplicity of schedule in your life. If you buy pretzel bread, it means you don't like status quo or to be held down or routine. If you buy white bread, that's me, you like to play it safe and you enjoy tradition. If you buy rolls, you enjoy family get-togethers with groups. If you like sourdough bread, it means you appear normal, but you've got a secret kick to you. <laughs> and you're an acquired taste in most friend circles. <laughs> if you buy a lot of whole grains, it means you want to be healthy and you want other people to see the need for their health. And I just wrote, if you like cornbread, you're my kind of people. <laughs> And I'll bring the beans and you tell me what time supper is. One of my favorite breads is right here. King's Hawaii. Got an amen on that. Didn't get an amen on scripture, but I got an amen on the rolls. King's Hawaiian. Ain't nothing like a King's Hawaiian roll. How many like them? Now, I didn't find out about these treasures until I was older. When I was a kid, we wasn't no king in my house. Wasn't no Hawaiian floating around in my house. We had white bread. We called it light bread. Anybody else grew up calling it that? And we had homemade bread that mom made like a fritter bread. Wasn't no, wasn't no Hawaiian king in my house. Now, it wasn't until I was older and I had a taste of one of these. Somebody gave me a sandwich on one of these of chicken salad. And chicken salad on a Hawaiian roll will make your tongue reach out and slap your eyeballs out. It is amazing. So I thought, man, this is new bread. Hawaii finally got their act together. This is what, it, yes. And then you read on the bag, they started making this bread in 1950. 1950? 1950? You've been hiding this out for 70 years from your mainland cousins? What gives? 1950 is when it's established, these King's Hawaiian rolls, and it's established as, as this um, on Hilo, Hawaii, as the Portuguese began to come over to the Hawaiian islands and bring the gospel of Jesus. They also brought their recipes for sweet bread. So the gospel and Hawaiian rolls go together. And it influenced the way the Hawaiians bake their bread. It's a, it's a favorite of mine, but there's nothing quite as exquisite, nothing as amazing, nothing as productive as the bread from heaven. It is your favorite bread. It's Jesus as the bread. Now, he's walking with his disciples. This bread is constantly walking, but he does something here with bread. And I, and I, want, you to really, I want you to really see, you, you know the story uh, but I want to back up and, and, and teach this. I want to pick apart this because I think it really speaks to us about our walk with God down the bread aisle of life. The event that I uh, read to you is Jesus stopping with a multitude because he sees that they're hungry. Now, this story is not recorded in Luke or John. It's only recorded for us in Matthew and Mark, this feeding of the 4,000. And I told you last week, sometimes we focus so much on the event that we forget the environment around it, and we leave out some of the most amazing things God's trying to talk to us about. The event of Jesus blessing seven loaves of bread to feed at least 8,000 people, 4,000 we have recorded, but that's men only, is an absolute heart-stopping miracle. And we should shout about that. But the environment leading up to it is just as powerful. I want, you to, I want you to hone in here with me for a moment because a lot of people think, well, this is just another alternative to the feeding of the 5,000. This is not the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000 is the mo most often preached because it, that's the story where it's a little boy's lunch that provides for the people. This isn't the feeding of the 5,000. This is a time when Jesus fed 
4,000 people. Now, if you want to read the feeding of the 5,000, flip a chapter to the left, it's Matthew 14. But in Matthew 15, he feeds 4,000. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he fed them on this side of the Sea of Galilee. But when Jesus is now feeding the 4,000, he feeds them on this side of the Sea of Galilee. And sandwiched in between is a storm on a sea where Jesus comes walking on the waves. It's not lost on me, the creativity of God, that he sandwiched a storm in the middle of the bread aisles. Jesus fed 5,000 with two fishes and five loaves, but the 4,000 he feeds with a few fish and seven loaves. The numbers are different. The 5,000 on this side of the sea was mostly Jewish people, but the 4,000 on this side of the sea are mostly Gentile people. He's feeding Jews over here and Gentiles over here. The 5,000 were fed from the lunchbox of a little boy. The 4,000 are fed by grown men that we call disciples. 5,000 were fed in Matthew 14. 14 or 4,000 were fed in Matthew 15. And it makes you think when you read from Matthew 14 to Matthew 15 that just a day passed. But that's wrong in our reading. I want you to understand that from when he fed 5,000 in Matthew 14 to where he fed 4,000 in Matthew 15, almost a year to the day has passed. He's feeding them almost a year apart. Now, we read it. We think he just got in. He's just opening up a bread-making business. He's doing it every day. This is a a year apart. And the feeding of the 4,000 begins when Jesus recognizes and talks about something that the disciples had not noticed. He talks about these, these people, this crowd, has a persistence in their walk. They're persisting in their walk. Notice what it says in verse 32. He says, they've been walking with me for three days, and they don't have anything to eat. They've been walking with me for how long? Three days, and they don't have anything to eat. And he says, three days, they've been very persistent in their walk, and now they're at a place of being very, very hungry. And if we send them away in this condition, they'll what? They'll faint. They'll pass slick out. They're hungry. They need, they need food. And he's showing something with what he's about to do on a, on a bigger picture. You, you can't fail to see this. And he says, they've been with me three days. They've lost something inside themselves. And now that they've been three days, I'm going to restore that which has been lost. He's painting a bigger picture of Calvary. That for three days, if you're going to hold consistent and persistent in your faith at Calvary, when you hold on those three days, you're about to faint on day three. But God will restore something on day three that you lost in day one and two. Persistence. It's preaching to us that God takes note and moves to bless the persistence of our walk. Your first point is this, that the evidence of your persistence is what it takes out of you in the walk. Nobody walks with Jesus And stays full all the time. Now, I know we like to think that, and it sounds spiritual, but let's testify this morning. Anybody ever felt drained doing this walk of faith? Look around, all these people don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. It drains you. It it takes something out. Now, if you're a hit and miss believer, you don't know the blessing tied to persistence because you don't walk through enough storms to need both sides of the bread. You see the storm, you grab a cracker, you roll out. You know, man, life got rough. Give me one of them Keeblers. I'm out. People that walk with Jesus say, yes, he fed me here, and I'm going to walk through this storm. Why? Because I know my God is a persistent and consistent and faithful God, and if I walk through this storm, there will be bread on the other side because he's never failed me nor forsaken me. He will keep me. When you walk with Jesus with persistence, you have seasons where you feel depleted. I want you to think about that. It's true in every area of life. Let me teach you a little bit this morning. In your marriage, it will not always be days of sunshine. <laughs> some, some brothers help Mason out. Other brothers feel that too. There are moments in your marriage that you have to stay persistent. Anything worth having is worth fighting for. And so when you feel like, man, this is... You, you go through lulls in marriage, 
dips, downturns, hurts, wounds. I can't believe she said that. I can't believe he thought that. I can't believe he believed that. I can't believe he talked to them. It stays persistent, but it drains it out of you. Your job will drain it out of you. Your family, your children will drain it out of you. Your friends will drain it out of you. If you, you don't walk with persistence and not feel some pressure is what I'm trying to say. You don't walk with persistence and not feel some perspiration every now and then. It gets hard. It gets heavy. But it's worth it. It's worth it to stay persistent. The woman with the issue of blood stayed persistent in her walk. And even though she was drained and depleted, she said, I'm going to walk one more day because if I can touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be what? Made whole. I stayed persistent in that. It's an uncomfortable chapter to walk through, but it gives you undeniable faith. When you're somebody who is not a twinkle toe believer, but you've walked through the storm and you've walked through the valley and you've walked through the battle, and you can stand up with a testimony and say, no, it has not always been easy, but praise God, he's never left me and he's always provided for me. I've never done without. He's always fulfilled his mission in my life. You say, well, if you're doing it right, Pastor, then you should never be at the place where you feel worn. Really? Really, Bubba? You should never feel worn? You should never feel heavy? No, not if you're walking with Jesus, right? You should never go to a place where you feel hungry. I'm reminding you of Matthew 15. These people walked with the bread of life for three days and were still hungry. If I'm wrong, they're wrong. They walked with him for three days and they're still hungry. And not just a little bit of hungry, they're hungry enough to pass out. You ever been that hungry? <laughs> I felt like I was, but I don't think I've ever been there. I felt like I about was, where my belly button was touching my backbone. I was like, oh, God, I'm so hungry. But I ain't never really been there. These people are so hungry, they're about to faint because they're not just not eating. They're walking through the desert. And we know medically it happens when you're hungry, your blood sugar begins to drop. And what's the result of that? You get shaky and weak and irritable. Hangry is what we call it. You get like this. <laughs> and you say, we got to eat lunch. Where do you want to eat? I really don't care. I'd eat side of a cow right now. Wherever you want to pull into, I'm just about to fall over. And you dare anybody to try to talk to you. You say, what do you think about this? How do you feel about it? Mm-mm. 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 No, we no talky right now. We eaty. We no talky. I need food. Your walk in faith doesn't give you immunity to the challenges of life. Even in your faithfulness, life has a way of playing the game so that when you're trying to get to the next level of your life, you feel hungry. And when you're there at the point of possibly fainting, your emotions will play tricks on you. And your emotions will begin telling you that the wilderness you're in is greater than the one you're with. That what's around you will swallow you. It's bigger than the one you've been walking this whole way with. Church, listen to me. I'm telling you something right now. In life, as it pushes and pressurizes and tries to starve you out, the enemy will make you believe that God will let you dry up on the vine, wither away, and die, and nobody will care that you were here, and nobody will care that you were gone. But that is a lie from the depths of hell. You've got to get up every morning in the middle of the pressure and say, you know what? I still believe that God is able to help me and push me through with my persistence. I'm not leaving him. I've come too far to turn back now. I put my hand to the plow and I don't care if mama don't go if daddy don't go if brothers don't go if sisters don't go I will keep walking with Jesus down this bread aisle of life and he will come through for me he'll make a way he'll make a way the compassion of Jesus is engaged to those people in their walk get this not by the signs of their visible strength but by their weakness here's your point Compassion is responding to visible weakness, not strength. There are two groups of people in this story, the picked out and the popped in. (laughs) He picked out the disciples, but this crowd popped in. 
Isn't it funny that the people who were picked out thought they had privilege over the people who just popped in? Jesus said, women following three days, they're hungry. And the picked out said, well, what you going to do about that? They got bread in their pockets. Uh, 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 man. What you going to do? Jesus is not just concerned with people who have spiritual titles and proud pedigrees. He's focused on people with no titles, no status, people who don't have verified blue badges on Twitter, people who are not a kind of plastic or bougie. He wants everybody to have the bread. Even if you're not feeling this morning like you're one of the picked out ones, I want you to know this story is showing Jesus has enough for not only picked out people but popped in people too. See, well, I wasn't raised in church. My mom and daddy wasn't a preacher. I didn't do all this. You, I, I just popped into this faith. You are just as important to, the, to Jesus this morning as those who have been raised in church for 3,000 years. Jesus has moved with compassion on them. He is revealing his heart for them. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Power in the hands of people with no heart is a dangerous thing. But power in the hands of somebody with a heart is a beautiful thing. The disciples don't have no heart. He says, I have compassion on them. That major is taught on this on Wednesday. I've been moved with compassion. In the Greek, the word is spagkinesomai. It means the study of the guts. In medical terms, it's called splachnology. Did I get that, Sue Ann? Splachnology. Did I get that, Nick? Splachnology comes from that Greek word. It means the study of the intestine, the digestive system, the visceral organs. People study this. And Jesus says, I'm moved with compassion on them. I'm splachnizomide for them. Meaning what? You have been walking with them for three days and you won't even give them a second glance. But when I look at the weakness that's in them, my guts are moved in me. I can't let them go another day and not feed them. I can't send them home knowing that they will pass out. It means you have a compassion to the place that you begin to feel what somebody else is feeling on the inside. We have a lot of people today who want a Ph.D. to be able to diagnose what's wrong with you, to tell you what you need to do, to tell you how you need to do it. But we have a shortage of people who say, I feel what you are feeling and I want to help you because I feel for you. Not just tell people what's wrong, but feel what's wrong with them. I, I, I tell this story, and, I, and I'll tell it again, that when I had my first kidney stone, and I loved my wife, but she was not compassionate. Splagnesomai was not in her vocabulary. I woke up that morning feeling like death had made a registration with me. I was in the floor. How many have had a kidney stone? Know what I'm talking about. I was in the floor, doubled over, 7 o'clock in the morning. Oh, God. She goes, what's wrong with you? (laughs) I think I'm dying. And I feel like she was about to say, can you die a little quieter? Trying to to sleep. She goes, what is that? I said, oh, my stomach. My stomach, my back, my lower right back. I don't know. Babe, I think I'm going to see Jesus. She says to me. Oh, it's probably something you ate last night. Just get back in bed. It's our only day to sleep in. Um, I'm dying. I said, you go on back to sleep. I'll drive myself to the hospital. Thinking, she would say, are you crazy? I'll drive you, honey. And she said, sounds good. Keep me up to date. Okay. I get to the hospital, walk myself in, bent over, all the way up to the ER, sweating, white as a sheet, pajamas, which is not me. And the lady says, how can I help you? I'm dying. What hurts? Everything worse than anywhere. 
my back, my lower back, my chest, my stomach, my head, my eyes, everything hurts. Oh, okay, well, have a seat and we'll call it. No, 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 today I'm dying right here at the desk. And so I, I name dropped of people I knew that were back there, doctors and nurses. Please tell them I'm out here. And so they come out and they took me back. That's probably not the right way to do it, but I was dying. And I got back there in the room, and the nurse that I love that was there, and she, she said, Pastor, what's wrong? And I said, I, <laughs> again, I think I'm dying. This hurts, this hurts. Never had hurting like this. She says, okay, hang on a second. The doctor comes in, and he looks at me, and he says, you're having a kidney stone. And he said, um, you're having a kidney stone, and I know how you feel because I have kidney stones. And in that moment, I felt Relief. Why? Because he knew exactly how I felt. And he said, I'm going to give you a shot, and this will make you feel good immediately while we figure out what's going on. And it did. Whoo, doggy. And I said, I'm so glad that doctor felt me. He felt what I was going through. It's the saying that we say in our culture, you feel me? That came along in 2010. You feel me? And what does that mean? That means, do you understand what I'm saying? Not just in your ear, do you feel it? Do you feel me? Earlier in that, 2007, we came up with a phrase, all up in my feels. Means what? I feel it everywhere. I, 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 I feel that. And when Jesus says he's moved with compassion, it's because he feels what they're going through. And the disciples say... <laughs> We're not feeling it. We're in the wilderness. There ain't no Walmart. There ain't no Dollar General. No Kroger. A&P and Big Bear shut down. We're in Samaria, so there's no Piggly Wiggly either. It's, it's, it's not possible here. Now, don't miss this. Here's what frustrates me about this scripture. These are the same men who just a year earlier watched him take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000. The same men. Don't you think they should have said, we have seven loaves. Let's watch you do it. That's what I think. Here, Lord, we were hiding them away because we're stingy and heathen, but here they are. Take them and feed these 4,000 people. But they say what? We don't know where you're going to buy bread at. We don't know where you're going to get it at. God has a way of not only using people who are your friends to bless you, but he has a way of using people who don't want to bless you to bless you. The Bible says he will make your enemies your footstool. Meaning what? That's not just for you to kick back on a lazy boy and put your legs on him. What do you use a footstool for? To get higher. Jesus said, you're not elevated by your buddies. You're elevated by your enemies. The people who didn't want to bless you to begin with, God has a way of turning their heart so much so that it not only blesses you in the moment, but it lifts you higher than you were before you got to that place. And he looks at this crowd and he says, these guys don't want to feed you, but they're the only ones with food. How I love it because they say, where are we going to buy bread? And he turns around and asks them a question. How many loaves you got? They hadn't showed him. How many loaves you got? And here's the message of the story. This is not year-old bread. They ain't carried this for a year. If you go back and read the beginning of chapter 15, the, the Pharisees are jumping on the disciples for doing something. What are they jumping on for? Not washing their hands before they eat bread. Meaning what? They had bread earlier in the day. They've stowed seven loaves away in their pocket. This ain't old bread. This is new bread. What are they doing with it? Hiding it. Hoping he'll send away the crowd so they can get around the campfire and eat it. And Jesus says, wait a second. That bread that you got in your pockets, that's leftover bread. But God, this is your last point. God is able to use leftovers and turn them into launching pads. These people don't know what it is to eat that bread, but the disciples have it, and he takes it from them. Anybody here ever grew up on leftovers? I did my whole life. 
My mom was the leftover queen. My mama was a leftover queen. In every refrigerator that grew up like this, Cool Whip bowls and butter bowls, you don't know what you're going to open up and get. Amen? You're my people. People say, oh, you got a bunch of Cool Whip. That ain't Cool Whip. That could be corn, dressing, stuffing, chicken. I don't know what's in it. Sweet taters. It's a surprise every time you pop a lid. Ooh, green beans. Pop them open. Butter bowls and Cool Whips are what we lived on. It was, it was leftovers. Why? Because my mama and my mama didn't want to have to go to the kitchen every single day and cook a big meal. So they cooked enough to feed a small army. And you eat on it that day and the next day and the next day. And here's the blessing about leftovers. As it sets in the container, it seasons a little different than what it did when you for anybody know good leftover food. The salt works its way. The pepper works its way. The gravy works. Good day after chili is the best chili you ever eat in your life. It gets thicker. It gets better. And so God said, I know. I gave you that bread this morning. You thought you were going to hide away it for you. But these people, I'm going to take what was a leftover for you and make it a launching pad for them so they get a miracle of the blessing and God still today takes the leftovers of the blessings he gave you and pours it onto other why why does he do that pastor because our God has never been labeled as the God who is just enough he is the God who is more than enough he always pours out more than you need so the blessing can go on when, when, when David's in the valley of the shadow of death, what does God do? He doesn't make him a TV dinner. He prepares a table before him in the presence of his enemies, and his cup overflows. He's always the God of more than enough. God will use your enemy and the leftover that's laying around to raise you a layer that you never thought possible. Anybody remember old school Mario? Original Mario looked like this, the screen. This is the Mario of Mario's. Now people say, oh, that's so easy. Wasn't nothing easy about Mario. <laughs> you all spoiled in Mario today. Once you go all the, once you go right on this Mario, you can't go back and explore what you did yesterday. Mm -mm. Once that closes, that day's done. You miss your flower power, sorry, gone. You miss money that day, gone. And the hard thing about this Mario was you only got so many lives. And I don't care if you made it to level 7, if you died in level 7, if you ran out of energy in level 7, if you ran out of coins in level 7, and you expired, what happened? Game over. And you got to go all the way back to level 1 that you just spent two hours getting level 7 on. You all have something now called continue. Would you like to continue? I would like to continue in the 80s. But I remember when I found out about it, the secret continue. If you don't know about the original Mario secret continue, I'm about to rock your world. You'll go home and want to play it. You still got it. When you get a game over in original Mario and it takes you back to the title screen trying to entice you to start all over, if you hold in the A button and push start, it takes you right back to where you died with brand new lives. It's a glitch. Now, here's the deal. It was in the game the whole time. But I need somebody to tell me it. Now I can beat Mario anytime. Because I get to continue. Jesus has the ability, like nobody else, that when you feel like you're running out of your last bit of energy, and the devil says, well, see, you're not as good as her, and you're not as good as him. So you're going to have to go back and just do this whole thing. He don't care. You're going to have to go. No, no, no. God has a way of walking down the bread aisle, pulling it off the shelf, and saying, here, here's your blessing for now. Start right here. When you mess up in this walk and you say, well, I've just I've made a mess up. I've blown the whole thing. Repentance is your A start. When you repent, God comes and says, yes, you did. You blew it. But here's a brand new mercy. 
here's a brand new grace. Continue on into this level. Continue on into this level. Continue on down this track and this track. You have to see that God is wanting you to walk with him more than sometimes we want to do the walking. And he blesses us to do it. As you come to music, I'm closing. Something that I hadn't caught until I read this again last night. It's a subtle difference, and maybe it's just because I'm weird I pick up on subtle differences. In Matthew 14, when he feeds the 5,000, he tells them to sit down on the grass. But in Matthew 15, he tells them to sit on the ground. Two different words in the Greek. They don't mean the same thing. Grass is a lush place, a comfy place, a place positioned to hear. But ground in the Greek is a different word. It means a bare, a bottom, a no advantage place. That's weird to me. And it also preaches to me. That sometimes before you're ready to receive the blessing God had in store for you, you have to hit rock bottom. You have to hit ground level. And say, God, I've given this all I have, and I don't know how to do it another day. And God says, that's where I needed you to be. Because in your weakness, I am made strong. The bread, Mason, is not broken and passed out till they reach ground level. It's a nudge. It's God nudging them to the ground. Now, we resist that because we don't like that. We like to be up. And God says, well, sometimes you need to be here so you can receive. At the airport, those big thousand-pound jets, you can put up the last picture. I think I gave it to you. Are pushed by a little bitty vehicle, a little bitty vehicle compared to a jet. These are called taxis, airway taxis. You know why they do that? They have to nudge a plane into the correct position so it can take off to its next destination. Because airliners don't have reverse. They can't go backward. So something else has to come along and nudge them into proper position. You better thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because there's been more times than you can probably count that you felt like you didn't have it in you to back up any. God, I can't go back and, and do that again. I can't, I can't, <laughs> no. I can't relive that again. And the Holy Spirit comes along like an airway taxi and says, it's okay, I'll nudge you. God, why are you nudging me into this corner? Why are you nudging me into this place? Why are you nudging me to the ground? I'm nudging you to get you in position for takeoff. If you don't allow God to position you, you'll never reach the runway for your next destination. And as these 4,000 are following Jesus, he's nudging them to the ground. Why? Because you need your strength to walk this next mile. This morning, you, whatever reason, you're here at church. I don't know all the things that went through that that got you here today, but you're here at church, and it could just be that God changed this message to speak to you, to nudge you into the place you need to be for position. He's broken the bread. He's using the leftover. He's giving you a launching pad this morning. And the whole time I've been talking, the Holy Spirit has been nudging you. You need to deal with this. You need to get this, you need to get this right. You need to be in this position. You need to get right here. If that's for salvation this morning, I want to offer that to you. If you're ready to be saved today, I'm inviting you to come. Come on. Come on, be saved. Say, what does that mean? I'm turning my life around. I'm turning it over. I'm not living this way anymore. This morning, I felt God calling me to Him. Don't walk out of here the way you walked in. This could be the day when if you walk away in this position, you'll faint. Let God feed you. Salvation this morning. Anybody want to be saved? Come on. Repent. I've, I'm not doing that life anymore. I'm done with it. I need forgiveness. I need to live a brand new life. If that's you, come on.
Just get out of your seat. Come on. The Lord prepared this message for you today. Nudged me into this position to give you this message today. Come on. I want to be saved this morning. I want to be saved this morning. I want to know that I'm, that I'm secured with Christ. Come on. Ask this. Everybody in this room who feels like you're ready, you, you've been keeping persistence, but you need the bread. You need the bread of God. I need God to feed me. Pastor, I, I'm feeling the faintness. I'm feeling the, the heaviness, the pressure. I need God to feed me. If that's you, I want you just to stand right there where you're at. Come on, just stand to your feet. I need some bread. He's fed me before, but I've been through a storm. I'm on the other side of this now, and I need some bread. Ain't nothing. There's no shame in that. Yep. Any, come on, there's some more. I need bread. I need living bread. I'm going to invite you who stood, or those who should have stood and didn't, to come up for prayer. The prayer team would pray with you. This church is praying with you. I'm praying with you. Come on.